We get it, the machine's cheap. Today we're looking at one of the hottest printers around right now, the Snapmaker U1. This tool changer machine boasts four tool heads, allowing for lightning fast color or material swapping. No purge waste, no color bleed, and the thing's less than $1,000. But what's the real cost for that level of affordability? Well, today we're gonna dive into the unboxing and setup of this machine. Following that, I wanna touch on some of the specs and the things that make this one unique. And finally, we're gonna spend a little bit of time printing just to get an idea of how the machine performs. This is gonna be an initial impressions video, not some full comprehensive review video just yet. But I wanna try and begin answering the question, why is this printer so cheap? All right, let's start with the unboxing because unlike a Centauri Carbon or something like that, there's actually quite a bit going on here. There's a lot packed into the box and really it's not all that heavy. That's probably because I'm super strong though. Actually, I promise that's not the case. But with the box on the bench, I can promptly move it to the floor because this machine, much like other machines I've reviewed recently, comes out of the top of the box. <sighs> Everything's wrapped in plastic and bubbles and stuff to prevent any shipping damage. We certainly wouldn't want to break any of the glass pieces of the printer or something before we even get it out of the box. Boy, would that suck. But with the machine pulled straight out the top, we can begin unwrapping this sucker. Like a delicious cling-wrapped leftover turkey from Thanksgiving, because your mother-in-law insisted that you take some home anyway. As we begin unwrapping our holiday turkey printer, we can begin to see exactly what's happening here. Much like the multicolor machines we've opened in the past year, and again like a turkey, there's a bunch of stuff stuffed inside of the machine. But first we take off the top. After removing some tape and stuff, we can get into the boxes inside of the body of the printer. And with these two boxes removed and set aside, we can continue freeing up the machine. The tool head, or the carriage I guess in this case, is encased in foam to protect it during shipping. The heated bed is held in with well-labeled screws. So don't be a fool and forget to take one of these out, or you might have a bad time. I mean, that would sure be a bummer if you forgot to take one of these screws out and then turned on the machine or something. Could you imagine? Aside from that, there are these two brackets in place that hold everything together during shipping. These need to be taken out and then we can continue removing tape. This printer's got tape everywhere you look, even on the build plate. That seems a little bit extreme, but at least it comes off reasonably easily. And with a decent amount of that removed, we can move on to investigating some of the build quality of this printer. Now, I didn't want to dive into this too much just yet. But this was the point that I really became aware of just how cheap some of the pieces appear on this printer. I know everybody on YouTube loves this printer and I like it too, but I can't overlook this. So quickly, let's talk about some of my first impressions before I keep unboxing and setting everything up. I think this is a well thought out machine just based on the pieces and how everything is laid out. The documentation's clear, the packaging is intentional and super well suited for the components. And by and large, all the pieces seem to be well put together. But there are loads of parts that kind of remind me of the fact that this printer was made to a specific cheap price point, which I want to clarify is not something that's bad. It's just something that you need to be aware of. For example, everything flexes a lot. The plastic on the top here just moves a lot in general if you push on it or if you're working near it or if you breathe on it too hard. And these covers here are literally taped during shipping to make sure they don't rattle off because they're super loose in general. Also, things like the spool holders are fine, and I'm sure they work just fine. But you aren't getting a spring inside of it to wind the spool and keep tension, for example, like you might find on the AMS light from Bamboo. Or the white casing on the outside of the machine, for example, it's secure, but the fitment leaves a bit to be desired. And overall, these aren't huge concerns immediately. Likely, we're looking at cosmetic things, and that's really not a big deal. After all, this printer is not trying to match the bamboo level of refinement, especially at this price point. But I still can't help but wonder, if they're neglecting these details, what other details are they possibly neglecting that we can't see? You know what I mean? And let's talk a little bit about things you can't see. 
Today's sponsor, PCBWay, is great if you want to have something printed, molded, folded, CNC milled, or generally manufactured. And if you don't want to be the one loading the filament, starting the machine, preparing the print, or seeing anything happen at all, then check them out because they've got you covered. They've got loads of processes available at their factory that you have access to, things like 3D printing metal and stuff like that, but also CNC milling, PCB manufacturing, sheet metal fabrication, just anything that you need made, they can help you out with. You just upload your model, specify the stuff that needs specifying, and their experienced technicians will take that information, make your thing, and the next time you even think about it will be when it lands at your door. So thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Check the link in the description if you want more information about how to make stuff without having to worry about making stuff. Now, with most of everything stripped away, we can open these two boxes to begin the actual machine setup for this well-basted bird. These two boxes contain everything we're going to need to get printing, but there's a few steps that need to be taken before we can get to that point. For starters, there's the accessory box. This houses all of the things. Spool holders, tool heads, feeder units, and all the tools needed to stick everything together. Now I do need to take a second to break something to you guys. You guys, my loyal followers. This is the point in the process where I actually had to do something super drastic and something that's really out of character for me. Honestly, I don't know what came over me. And it was a difficult decision for me to tell you, but I value transparency. I know you guys are counting on me to tell you the truth. I knew this had to be done. I couldn't put it off anymore, so here we go. This was the point where I actually read the instructions. I know. I feel just as bad about it. Sorry. But looking through this setup booklet, there is actually a lot going on. Still, I only kind of skimmed it, but the general gist is this. First, I threw on the filament feeder motors. There's one for each side, with two motors each, feeding two tool heads each. Each side's got a little ribbon cable feeding power and data and junk to them. And these guys actually aren't very easy to plug in. I really had to get in there and push and make sure everything was seated properly. But after the smaller tubes are plugged in from the backs of the feeders and into the underside of the top of the machine, we're good to install the tool heads themselves. Now these units are pretty compact and it looks like Snapmaker's done well to keep things simple. They aren't quick swappable or anything like that and I see plastic gears in there so truly there's nothing fancy hiding under here. But the design does seem sound. They have these little slider deals in here that need to be slid correctly for the locating dowels to be aligned properly. The first tool head or the furthest to the left is opposite to the rest. So pay attention to the orientation of that slider deal. From there the tool head installation is pretty simple. Just throw it sort of close to where it needs to be by sliding it onto the locating dowel and the magnets and stuff will make sure that the unit is captured correctly. After that, I repeated for the following three heads and moved on to some more plumbing and wiring and stuff. The larger tubes from the kit are the ones that feed the tool heads directly and they are notched on one end and smooth on the other. The notched end goes into the tool head, which makes me super happy that I actually read the instructions because I would not have gotten this right. And then we can move on to the USB-C cables that power everything individually. One end is routed with these plastic guides that direct the wiring and tubing. The other end simply plugs into each tool head individually. Both sides are held in with these little screws and securing everything took forever. If you find yourself putting this kit together, you should consider maybe getting a dedicated hex driver set or an electric screwdriver or something because putting all these in there using the provided Allen wrench was fine, but it took forever. I always try and use the provided tools when putting something together just to make sure I get the full experience to allow for a more complete review of the process. But I would recommend an electric screwdriver like these Fantic ones that I always use for everything else. But to Snapmaker's credit, there are extra fasteners included in the kit luckily. This helps a lot when you inevitably drop one and lose it forever deep inside the guts of the printer that you haven't even turned on yet. From there I threw these clips on to help keep everything nice and tidy and we moved on. The last procedure we needed to observe has something to do with the belt tension, I think. Again, I only skimmed the instructions, but the idea kind of makes sense. First you loosen these two screws on the tool head, or the carriage deal. From there you move it around to all four corners of the machine before finally re-tightening the screws to lock everything in place again. I think that's it. I think it's probably time to fire this turkey up. But before we do that, what kind of specs are we dealing with here? What can you use this machine for? 
Of course, we've got the four tool heads that operate individually using a common carriage. That's the cool thing about this printer, that's what we all know. This setup allows for super fast filament switching so you can do multicolor without any purge waste, but it also allows for multi material printing. So, support material and target material limitations are all but gone. Also, this machine allows for multicolor TPU printing, which is super uncommon right now. But that's going to have to wait for a different video. Let's talk about those tool heads a little bit more. It looks like they're a standard setup, which is to say they're not hardened units. So no carbon fiber reinforced or abrasive filaments for this system. And since there's no top glass or cover for this printer, you're not going to be printing with anything warp prone either. So really this machine is geared towards the more casual user that's not going to be printing any crazy engineering stuff all the time. The hot ends can heat to 300 celsius, which is enough. The bed heats to 100 celsius which also is enough. There's a camera that does AI detection, so no more accidental overnight spaghetti happening. Besides, the only spaghetti that you should be wanting is nacho spaghetti in the form of this t-shirt that you can get at keoprints.com. Check the link in the description. Otherwise, you've got the usual array of sensors, which allow for things like vibration compensation and pressure advance. And on top of it all, they've built out an app to partner along with their own fork of Orca Slicer. Yep, that's right, another slicer. And this one's interesting because similar to Orca Flash Forge, they didn't even reskin the slicer. It's just like Snapmaker Orca. So on one hand, I feel like we don't need another slicer. Why don't you just use mainline Orca? Apparently this works with regular Orca slicer, but I haven't done that personally. Why don't we just use regular Orca slicer? Why do we need Snapmaker Orca slicer? Like they're not even trying to hide the fact that it's Orca slicer. They're just calling it Snapmaker Orca slicer or whatever. Don't get me wrong. I kind of prefer that on one hand, like, we don't need a reskin version of Orca Slicer and just call it Anycubic Next or Creality Slicer or whatever. Like, we all know it's Orca Slicer. Anyway, you guys know how I feel about having a million slicers. I decided to stick with the Snapmaker one because I want the full experience as if I was a beginner opening this thing for the first time. I'm sure I'll be investigating that as I move on with this machine a little bit because my toolbar is getting crowded and it's just slicers on there. Everybody's got a different slicer, but they're all the same. Oh well. Finally, we can power this sucker on. We've done all the setup and assembly, so let's throw some spools on there. The kit that I bought comes with four little baby spools, so I loaded them onto their respective holders. Similar to the AD5X, these are mounted on the side, making this complicated setup a much more compact system. I am a huge fan of this. I'm a huge fan. Also, it looks like Snapmaker hopped on the RFID train, so that's pretty cool. This unit automatically figured out what spools I loaded onto it, and I didn't even have to tell it. Now, if only all these manufacturers with their RFID spools could talk to one another and get on the same page to open all that up. Imagine a world where you can load a bamboo spool onto a Creality printer, and it just knows what it is. I mean, it's never going to happen, but a girl can dream. But now's the part we've been waiting for. Let's see if this thing's actually any good. So to get there, we need to do the usual language and Wi-Fi setup if you choose to connect it to the internet. As I understand it, you don't need to, but I typically do because I like the convenience. From there, we do some calibrations. I forgot a bed screw. Oh, well, that screw's gone forever too, so let's try this again. We're met with the usual vibration compensation and leveling and stuff like that. But the process is a little bit different when it goes to do the auto tool head alignment. I'm not exactly certain of how this process works, but there's a good graphic on the product page that sort of explains what it's trying to do. For this calibration, the machine prompts you to remove the PEI print bed so it can probe this spot on the bed. And after a bit of that, like magic, you've got perfectly calibrated, perfectly located, for tool head printing. And that's how it should be. We shouldn't need to intervene in any major way. We shouldn't have to print some specific calibration print and do measuring and stuff and then edit the G code with the values that we've got from our print and stuff like that. It should just do it on its own and be done well. And it appears to have been done well. I like that. I like that. And if you do indeed like that, consider joining our $2 a month Patreon. If you want super small, often insignificant, and very infrequent perks, like discounts at keoprints.com and early access to videos sometimes, well, you can join us there and help us reach our goal to do this content creation thing full time. Also, you can just like join for free and hang out. Check the link, have a look.
Now finally, to briefly touch on the print quality of this machine for a second, let's see what we've got. I think it's all right. I would even say it's pretty dang good. Maybe even super great. The first thing I printed was this dragon that was on the machine. It turned out great. The colors are lined up super well. It was fast considering the amount of color changes happening on each layer, and overall it looks like super quality. But this is a very textured model, and sometimes the textured models can hide imperfections. So let's try something else. So from there I moved into the Keoprint standard, the Nacho Test. This model is the standard in this basement because I print it on all the machines so I know what it's supposed to look like, and it reminds me of my old dog Nacho, who was the best boy. This print only took a few hours once again due to the super fast filament changes happening, and once it finished and I was able to get eyes on it, I was sold. The quality is for sure there. Somehow this machine can hang at a low price point, but still print like the big boys. And as somebody that doesn't have very much money, I like that. Now I'm going to be doing quite a bit more printing on this machine in the future because there's a lot to explore, so stay tuned for some content on that, and let me know what specifically you would like to see me print on this machine. But as it stands, my initial assessment is like, super good. Like I'm very impressed. Everybody on YouTube is like, oh it's so good, it's so good. And then that video was sponsored by Snapmaker. But I bought this machine myself, and I'm impressed with it. Very good. Very good. So then why is this printer so cheap? Well, even with the build quality concerns in mind, I still don't know how this machine is as affordable as it is. But of course, I purchased mine at the Kickstarter price, which was like a few hundred dollars less than it is currently, I think. So really, for all intents and purposes, this machine's like a thousand dollars. And I guess when you put it in that perspective, it's not cheap. Like a thousand dollars is a lot of money. But when you consider what you get, like there's four tool heads and it can do something that not many machines can do right now. And it does it really well. They've packed quite a feature set inside of the thousand dollars for sure, but in order to make a proper assessment, we're gonna have to see how this thing stands up after hundreds or thousands of print hours. So once I've printed a bit more, I'll let you know what I think. Currently though, I'll say it again, I'm very impressed. The thing seems super solid even with the questionable build and finishing, and if it continues to print well, we could seriously be onto a winner here. So if you want to support our goal to do this full time, again, check the link below for our Patreon. It's only two bucks a month and you can be helping us bring this content to you more regularly. Otherwise, grab a shirt at keoprints.com. We got nacho spaghetti. We got build plate beware. There's a couple of kid sizes because I needed one for my kid. We got Keo stuff on the front. This really cool nozzle shirt that I forget what I called it, but it's pretty cool. Just go check it out. Also, I am going to be making more content with this, so let me know exactly what you'd like to see. Obviously, multi-material printing, multicolor TPU stuff, but what else? What else could I do with this machine that you might watch? Bye.